um, privileged to introduce Aspen today. Uh, so Aspen is an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes and a speaker of her tribal language, the Salish language. Um, she graduated with a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Montana in 2021 and earned a bachelor's degree in tribal historic preservation from Salish Kootenai College in 2018. Um, Aspen has a Montana Class 7 Native American Language and Culture Educator license and has taught language for 10 years. Uh, in addition to all of those amazing accomplishments, Aspen is a Native Ledger artist, and we're going to get an opportunity to hear a lot more about all of that today. So thank you, Aspen. Uh, Middlemost as Pussy Squest, so it is Cad Uchis Cadley Chis Ayakin Squation Sapt and E. Cadley Spadley Ukasanka Louis Cadley Yet Swa is Quad Quest and Quads is the Quad Quad Sketched Tas Sketched them. Oh, as yet, Louis Cold and a boot itch is quaver to insane. Yes, put it sham. Hello, everyone. Said good morning or good afternoon. Um, I am Bitterroot Sedlish, Blackfeet, uh, Kootenai, Kalispell, and Nez Perce. So that's my tribal affiliation. And today I'll be talking about uh, my upbringing and all the art that I've done, the things, the good things that I make with my hands. So that's the way that we say art in Salish. So it's like good with your hands. And I'll share my screen. And so that means we continue, we always are practicing our ways of knowing. And so a lot of my art is um, inspired from my Salish culture and language and some of our oral storytelling. And this uh, digital ledger art that I did was for um, Every Child Matters. And so the boarding school um it was a boarding school flyer that I initially made it for and just for the movement itself and so all these um images are from different old black and white images uh, a lot of them from Sedlish, Sedlish, and uh, I just kind of combined all their individual pictures and you know made them all you know in one line and I think it's just really cool to show this like 1800s uh, fashion, especially for Sedlish, is having, um, you know, like our our way that we did our leggings and the way that it's beaded at the bottom. Uh, you could just really see the way that we dress, especially still for our like winter dances. Um, and there's a lot of just regalia and things that we gather throughout the year to make our different um, outfits. So an overview of what I'm going to be discussing is the Tata'ayakin. So bitter Sedlish sign is talking about the hair that stands on top. So a long time ago, uh, especially the men, is kind of like nature of where, um, you know, birds, sometimes the male are the ones that have all the pretty feathers and then the women are, or the female are, you know, more like the plain ones. And so it was kind of that way a long time ago where the and men, they had a lot of ear piercings. And that's actually where the pondere, which is our our Kalispell, um, we got that word from the French pondere because that means earring. And it's because a lot of those men had a lot of ear piercings on their ear. So their entire ear was pierced. Whereas the women usually just had like one shell, you know, earring. And uh, they would also curl their hair. And so historically using like coal and a, like a stick, a smooth stick, they would heat that up and it would kind of be like a curling iron. So they would uh, kind of poof their hair up and then braid it. 
and then braid it into their other two braids. And so that's where that, that word comes in. Now, and so I'm going to talk about the intergenerational knowledge transfer. So that has to do with a lot of our culture and language and the art and these different tools and forms that are within that. Uh, and then the traditional art forms, the storytelling through ledger art, and then indigenizing my research. So uh, my master's thesis and some of my bachelor um, work and papers that I wrote, I tried to indigenize it. So a lot of times I would end up using um, aspects of our culture and especially by using art to, to convey that. No. Uh, uh, I, uh, so this is a map that I created for my master's thesis. Uh, there was quite a few maps around the coastal Salish tribes, and it didn't really include like all of our Salishian languages. So I wanted to create a new map that had not only our different tribes, but the words and terms that we use for our, our languages or our people. And so you could see um, the yellow in the far right corner is in Setlishtsin, and that's the um, our dialect here on the Flathead Reservation. So in Setlishtsin, this is our Aboriginal territory, and a lot of that runs from like the Bitterroot Valley down into uh, eastern Montana and Chamomo Tudla by Yellowstone into Idaho, Washington, and then all the way back up. And we also went like further into Washington and down like the river to go spear salmon and get our salmon for our seasonal uh, yearly uh, cycles. Uh, but this is just kind of like the main area that we stayed in. And so uh, this is only showing the Salish territory, but there's a lot of other tribes that were, you know, it was like coexisting and, you know, in the same territory as us. So there's like the Blackfeet, the Kasankla, um, you know, there's that overlap of territory. But uh, our Salish language is the furthest inwards from the coast. And then we have a lot of our other uh, speaking languages from the interior branch that are all the way up in Canada. So like the Okanagan, Uchinakhan, and Colville tribes. And I understand a lot of their dialect pretty well. So it's just kind of interesting to look at our different dialectal differences. And sometimes even the coastal Salish have similarities to um, our dialect here. And so our Insetlishtsin is the term that we use when we're talking to non Salish Skedlich people. And that has that Salish, Salish, and it's saying just like our Salish yeah, language. But if we're talking if we're talking within our own um like community, we call it in Khadlihtsin, so that's Khadlih, so Indian language. And along with speaking, our, our uh, elders and our ancestors, we always use sign language. So, and this is my yaya and my kachet, my grandma, my maternal grandma, and her sister, my auntie. And they're doing some of the signs for one of the um, sign language projects that I was working on. And then there's an image of my daughter and I teaching in one of the Missoula schools and it's Chief Charlotte school. Uh, and yeah, so it was like one of her first times coming with me into a school and teaching Salish and the signs. So it was a pretty um, proud moment for me to, you know, have her with me and just everything that I'm sharing with her. She ends up, you know, um, teaching other people and her own peers. Now, so these are a lot of my relatives and like the three up at the top, those are my great aunts. And they're some of my first uh, Salish language partners, so speaking partners and teachers. So my entire upbringing has been revolved around our and 
So I was raised around um, our elders and speakers, my relatives, and like all the ones that are on the top row. Those are my, um, some of the elders from here in Arlie and also Louis Adams. And so all of those elders were uh, my first teachers. And so just as a young, young kid, I was around them through sweats and, you know, my aunts and the things that they shared with me. And so they helped me to get this base of say the language. So I heard the articulation of our language and knowing, um, you know, all these cultural aspects. And so by the time I got into uh, almost junior high, I was like 13, I went over to Nkusum, say the immersion school and Patalik with the, um, with the beaded uh, grizzly bear paw. He was my main teacher in Sedlish uh, to at least help me to become a fluent speaker, him and Stephen Small Salmon. And so uh, uh, by the time I went to Nkusum, uh, just, you know, having that like early on language exposure, I was able to pick up on the language within just a couple of months. And he used a lot of stuchet So anytime I didn't understand something, he would fill it in with signs. Mm. And yeah, steep and small salmon. He was also one of my teachers there. And I think some of even my art, my early on art came from when I started at Nkusum. So when I was like 13 years old and I did a lot of drawing. And especially for Patalik, I like did, you know, just a lot of like animals and eagles and things like that. And then we were all also working on a lot of like traditional art. And so like shields and um, bows and arrows, drums, things like that. And so, uh, yeah, I was like working on my at least drawing at that age. And Eva Boyd, uh, she's been teaching me how to do uh, Sally bags and so weaving. And she's one of my um, you know, main language partners now because a lot of them on here are gone. So I go to her often. And she's also one of the ones that like teaches my children and helps with that enculturation of Kadlihutsen. <laughs> this is my great grandma. Adelaide Parker and she um she was always beating and you know doing all these skadlich sedlish women things of um creating regalia and doing a lot of like the traditional arts and I was just talking to my my mom today about um you know kind of the things that she learned from her her yaya and she said a lot of it was how to like bead and how to make ribbons uh shirts and skirts and you know the things we needed for our winter dances and so she was a big inspiration for my mom as far as like learning um you know some of this, these cultural uh arts uh different things you know and so like from her it was a part of that like intergenerational knowledge and so I think it's important that I mention my topia even though I didn't really get to meet her she passed away just before I was born but, um, you know, the things that she knew, her knowledge was transferred on to my mom. And so she taught me a lot growing up. And she's the one that taught me how to be my mother, you know, and she would learn from my tube. Yeah. But she was a really well-known beater. And uh, she did a lot of like that old style beadwork. So, good. And my mom said that um, she was always just telling her, you know, kind of to be an empowered Sedlish woman and, uh, you know, to do things and make it happen as a, a strong Sedlish woman. So I'm grateful for her. These are my, uh, some of my children and I only speak Sedlish to them and they're first language speakers of our language. And it actually skipped close to four generations. So my yeah, my great grandma was the last speaker, at least within my like initial family. Other than I had my like great aunts that were speakers too. So like three to four generation it skipped um, before we had first language Salish speakers within our community here. Um, I was like on the kind of border borderline uh, first language speaker because I was 13 and I had all that exposure early on. 
And so they say 13 and under is kind of first language, but um, I didn't quite have like for a full immersion, you know, as a baby and early on. So my kids get that from me where we, uh, I only talk Salish to them. And then I think it's important that they're learning our language along with culture. So our seasonal gathering cycles, our ceremonies, everything that has to do with our identity in order to keep them grounded and knowing um, how to properly use our language. You know, you really need to know the cultural aspects along with it because they coexist. You know, you gotta know culture and you gotta know the language for them to really um, to really teach you the full scope of our worldview. <clears throat> so this is Spectum, our bitter root. And this is one of our early on uh, spring foods that we gather. And so there's the petsets, our digging stick, but um, we have kind of these more contemporary petsets. And I still also use like a traditional petsa, but this is more of like made out of metal. And so the ways that I like to indigenize like contemporary um, objects is through like metal and plastic, you know, these things that we end up using, like sometimes they're even easier to use than our traditional tools and so like these metal pet says you could just dig up tons of bitter really quick whereas my traditional pet set well, that's a stick like it gets dull you have to resharpen it uh, there's just a lot of maintenance to it and so um, I'm gonna be making my kids an heirloom with the pet set because the top of it has uh, elk antler and so historically we would carve um, designs like our family designs into the antler and so I'm going to be making four of those hopefully in the next year or two um, that they could pass down to their children but with these contemporary tools we like to like add you know different art to it or wood burning especially if it's wood or even plastic um, doing some painting this is our sweatly our blue camas, and so this is also one of our um, spring foods. And so it's important that we learn all these different plants that are around us in the local ecosystem. And a lot of these things that I learned as a kid, I'm passing on to my children now. And all that knowledge that I learned from my elders and my family, like it's. It's really just in my in my heart. And so when I'm making art, all those things, you know, that are important to us that really show us what our identity is, you know, these things that are around us, the animals, the plants, the natural world, a lot of it reflects our, our world, you know, the things that are around us. So that's what I end up making art about is these different native plants the animals, the different traditions that Sedlish people do. And this is my my baby. And one of our techniques for stretching a hide while you're tanning it is putting a baby in the center. And that's during that stretching um, portion of tanning a hide. And so it was cute to, like he was really laughing and loved being in that center. <sighs> So I still any and all this gathering and the traditions that my kids are learning, you know, they're they're really taking that in. Like it's a, they're they're absorbing it so well that they it's just natural for them. Like they don't realize how um how much they know, you know, because it's just like they'll end up just saying, like, we already know this. And it's usually things that most people don't know. But my son, um, he my daughter got a cut on her finger and I asked him to go get a band-aid and it's like and he ran outside instead of you know going and getting my daughter a band-aid and he went and got some medicine or our traditional medicine that stops bleeding and you know prevents infection and so he went and got that and I was just proud of him because I was like oh he just ran outside maybe to go play but instead he came running back in and he knew what to get and so it's just cool to see that everything that I teach them, you know, they're they're listening. And even sometimes when I don't think that they're listening and they're just playing around, like they, it ends up coming up and then they end up being kind of the teachers to other people of their knowledge. And a lot of the stuff that I do with art around these native plants, they're usually right there with me, uh, drawing, you know, and um, learning how to bead and all these different things. <laughs> 
Aqua. This is our our baskets, our sinqtsestin. And so uh, every spring, we usually go out and get some cedar bark baskets. And we've been doing this a lot in the last couple of years, especially. And so, uh, you know, these traditional tools, things that we use for our culture, I feel like it, it, it's also art. Because if we're looking at the way that Salish people view art, our term for it that I learned from Patelik Pat Pierre was uh, so something good with your hands is more than one and so these like tools and these baskets they are art in them in their cell and within sorry I guess but then um you know that process is also an art process because there's so much maintenance to it there's so much work put into gathering and harvesting these different materials and so to even go out way up in the mountains to get this these cedar bark baskets and making that culturally modified strip so you're making these scars on the the ast there's a whole process to it and giving gratitude is also a part of that process and making sure that you're respecting the tree and not cutting too much of it and so there's all these different um, teachings, you know, that our elders and different knowledge keepers teach us so we don't harm the natural world and that we don't deplete resources. And so making sure that my, my kids and um, are understanding those things and making sure that they're giving thanks for everything that we take from, from our own stood from the land and uh, you know, it's an art form in its own because you have to gather a few different things like the willow that goes on the top to prop it open. And then all that time that goes into uh, stitching it up. And sometimes like this one in the center, I did kind of like a different uh, zigzag design on it and kind of has um, these triangle shapes. And now versus kind of some of our other more traditional ones is just like looping all the way through it. So you could get artistic with it. And I added like beadwork on one of my other chilquas in that corner. And so even just the traditional basket, it is an art form. It's something that you're doing good with your hands. And so that's that worldview of like something good with your hands. When we make anything from our heart, from, you know, just wanting to make something that's going to help our culture and the things that we're gathering throughout the seasons, and even this like cultural adaptation of new materials, we're spending that time, that energy that we're putting into it, into the spirit of these different plants and trees. So, um, you know, it's an art form and making sure that we're using them too, that they're not just hung on the walls. So a lot of my art, other than the ledger art, is usually pretty interactive. So the things that we use, the tools we use to gather throughout the seasons, we're always using them. And, you know, they don't end up lasting forever. Uh, the top corner, you could barely see my old basket. That was my very first chilqua, my first basket. And so it's all cracked up and now we finally retired it, but I was letting my son use it for a while. Um, but as soon as we started gathering things that were kind of like muddy and wet, it really made it crack fast. So, um, yeah, we just end up using the things that we make, these beautiful you know, pieces of art, but then knowing that like we're at least getting use out of it. And the reason why we don't have a lot of these artifacts now from our ancestors is because, you know, they used them. They used a lot of these things, the baskets, and it doesn't last forever. And so um, it's just a part of it. And I always end up, you know, just making more than critiquing my... Um, my style and like the things that we learned we're always learning as we go in these different processes finding new spots to gather and harvest now so our our storytelling our squid we could only tell coyote stories when there's snow on the ground and uh, so like kind of the winter months and before the first thunder and before the melt the snow melts and so uh, a lot of the art that I do, especially um, when I was younger, revolved around storytelling. So all of these coyote stories, I like to, um, you know, tell them. And sometimes 
um, I end up using like kind of these human forms and then adding on like coyote's head or these different animals um, and then making kind of like this this coyote story that has all the main components of uh, that story and so the um, the kind of the meaning the moral behind the story sometimes like that helps to inspire my art so that has that that blue camis and then this is just a raven lady with a pet set. So that's one of our traditional diggers. Pet set. And, uh, and so this is one of my, um, one of the things that I worked on when I was in my undergrad. So when I went to the Salish Kootenai College, I took a few classes there and I learned um, some more of the traditional forms of like, this is for drinking um, water and so like a lot of the men that were on horses and if they were like uh you know traveling somewhere and our tribe was a nomadic tribe so we're always traveling around there was like usually a designated water boy and they would have this uh from the Kwai, a bison horn and that that uh spetson that buckskin there was really long. So if they're up on the horse, they could drop it and the hole is kind of off to the, the side of this antler or this horn. So when it fell in the water, it would fill up and then he was able to just pull it back up to his horse. And then they would, um, you know, give everybody a drink of water that way. But I decided to do one of our coyote stories on here. And so I ended up wood burning our um, no salmon simply. And that story talks about no salmon for the Sedlish and our place name is down in Lolo. So that's Lolo, Lolo's um, name is Tumsumsli. And so around the thing, I, I made sure that I added like every uh, important aspect of that story. And so a lot of it is kind of like how we used to tell our winter counts. So it was very, um, you know, circular and you kind of just spiraled down. And so I uh, would burnt that whole story. And I just love the way that it turned out because it's a teaching tool. And so being able to take this to my students and the people that I teach, they're able to, you know, touch it, feel it and like, you know, learn sort of that history behind um, the water person who would you know get that water and how it was used and when it was used and then the story behind it so if it's in the winter months then I'm able to tell that story and this is my it's a, my traditional digger and I end up wood burning uh, our bitterroot story of how the bitterroot came to be and so the same thing it just spirals down and tells the whole story of the spirit bird and you know the the tears so uh, it's pretty cool how um, my kids, they're always like, you know, looking at it and then ask me to tell that story. And we end up using this pretty often when we're out digging bitterroot, we at least use it, you know, for half the time. And then we switch into our, our metal, more contemporary pets as that help us dig a little quicker. So... Uh, yeah, teaching, as um, Amy mentioned at the beginning, I taught Sedlish kind of on and off for 10 years. And I began learning Sedlish when I was only 13. So by the time I went over to the uh, Washington and went through the language apprenticeship, I became a teacher really young. I was only like 18 when I got my first class seven educator's license. And so I started teaching like Head Start all the way um, through like pretty much every grade, like kind of just going into different classes and then teaching even college age level. And so um, I always like to teach just pretty much seasonal rounds, seasonal rounds and, you know, the different times of year. So whatever was available, the resource, I like to use that with my students at St. Ignatius. So this is like a picture from that and like making sure that we're we're learning um, these different tools, the different weaving methods, and the skedlich that goes along with it, the Sedlish language. And if there's any history or even anthology of our elders and their stories, it's just a good time to learn and learn about like what's the what's the significance be behind some of our traditional art forms. 
So while you're sitting there making, you could share, you could talk, you could even have like an elder there to talk about their experiences when they were younger and just creating memory. And so with my own kids too, we're always out in the mountains almost every week we're out there just gathering something, being out there, um, interacting with the with the land and making sure that they're building memory based around our place names and the things that we do in those locations. And sometimes we end up coming up with new place names for the areas near our home because um, sometimes there's like not a place name that we know of today, but the things that we end up doing in those locations, I create a place name for it. And the way that we traditionally um, described a lot of our place Salish place names was what we were doing or the coyote story the kind of significance behind it and so there's like a format to like what are you describing and how is it being described so taking the way that our ancestors were um, coming up with new words and making sure that it still follows those patterns and the rules to the language of where everything gets added and so um, my kids sometimes end, end up coming up with new place names and then we interact with that area pretty often. Indigenizing spaces and so uh, the right is my one of my, my classroom from last year up at St. Ignatius and I just wanted to have a space where we um, it reflected more Salish culture. And so even taking more of these like contemporary things, like up in the lights, I got these uh, these cedar, it was like a cedar light cover. And so just making sure like the room was a little warmer and I was eventually going to put some like willows, <laughs> try to put willows if it wasn't like a fire hazard, you know, like over it. So it's kind of making more of this rounded shape. Uh, but I put like these shelves in and we were just slowly but surely filling up all of those like native plants from our gathering at school and then having art. So a lot of my husband's art was up in there with um, different Salish people and like our three chiefs. And so making sure that we're creating these spaces that, you know, capture like you know essences of our, our culture and making sure that we're hanging things that are authentic and real and so through art making and those traditional arts I feel like that's where you could really um, you know learn from the actual source itself like the real thing and my husband he made all those the other side is like at Ronan school and so he made a lot of murals and um, they're from some of our ancestors and some of them are like kind of from around like the 40s so the kind of these old black and white photos and that was just a cool way to um, have even like the native students, like some of them were their upyas, their grand great grandparents, and so it instills you know a sense of pride to seeing your own people up. And through art, you're able to do that. And he made it into this very contemporary aesthetic where it's just beautiful. You know, it's not just that old black and white photo. There's a lot um, going on in them, and um, a lot of families go and take pictures by them. And I guess you know they just know that it's. It's their relatives so it's really special to them to have that representation now so when i'm teaching i think of the ways that we could integrate authentic knowledge our Salish knowledge and so thinking about how do we even indigenize kind of these contemporary things and still teach the important information that needed to be shared for certain events. And so our tribal indigenous ways of knowing, the history, place-based teaching, indigenous education through oral storytelling, visual and doing, like that the indigenous education was really um, involved around like doing. And so from all of our, our tupes and our yaya, like all of our grandparents, the ways that they taught us was doing these certain things. Like you weren't just talking about beating or whatever it was, like you actually did it. And that's the way that our children learned. And it's a it's one of the best ways to learn is by actually doing things and learning that history and the language and the different terminology behind um, you know, making. So each of those different aspects of like making a canoe, a dugout canoe versus I'm making a tuli mat, you know, like there's different terms for weaving and um, throughout the process that they could learn and some of the trial and error that other people have gone through. And then they start to perfect their work. 
and then get inspired, you know, later on when they're adults. Then authentic feedback is, you know, just saying a good job, like, but it's just having, um, you know, real information of like, if it's the bison hunt, like the experiences that we have as people, it's always really good to just, you know, insert that our elders said this. And so through my ledger art, I teach a lot of that. And it's just like, if it's a certain person like Patalik, I might tell his story about shooting a bear when he was younger, you know? And so you're just, you're always integrating stories and indigenous understandings and the voices of our people. So it's important that it comes from Sedlish people, from the people of that, that culture. And so for my, my research, my MA thesis, I focused on Sedlish demonstrative system. And so that's kind of like the here and there words in English, here, there, over there. So when you have two speakers talking, you're talking about something like this water that I'm holding, you know, versus that water over there. And so for English, that's all we have is pretty much two words that describe everything. And it depends on like um, what you're talking about, where you just kind of like know what's going on, like what there is there, you know, whereas in Sedlish, our language is so descriptive that we have over 48 different ways to say here and there. And it depends on how far it is from the speaker, whether you could see it, some visibility. And then the common ground is whether the person you're talking to understands it. And so um, the way that I sort of indigenized my research was I wanted to add a lot of um, ledger art and things that are relevant to our peoples that are culturally significant. So I used Patalik, that's my uh, main language teacher that I was talking about. And this is his regalia and everyone who's seen him at Powell pretty much could recognize that that's his outfit and his war bonnet. But I wanted to include him in my research because he passed away like a year before I um, started my master's thesis. And so, you know, he's been this major inspiration to, to my language journey and wanting to only focus on language revitalization since I was 13. So I just wanted to, um, you know, have something, his essence there of like, this is him. And the reason why I know these demonstratives is from him. And he used to play a game that was um, kind of like this fun, interactive um, sounding, uh, what would you call it? Like a rhythm, you know, of these demonstratives, like, and so it was like a fun way for me to memorize the here, there, over there, way over there, right around here, you know, so he taught me those. And um, when I was writing a different paper for a class, it just made me remember that. And then I was like, I'm going to focus my thesis on this. And so focusing on this thesis, I um, wanted to have indigenous methodology. Sorry. <laughs> and then like the collective memory. So instead of using instances of going to the store or, you know, these kind of more sui upy things, I wanted to have that tribal memory of like, what is something that all of our tribal elders are experiencing, have experienced, and how can I get these terms that I'm looking for in our elder interviews for my research, you know, in a way that's like has to do with our ceremony or powwow. And so I chose powwow and making sure that, you know, like um, they're sort of talking about things that really happen within our community. And then that culturally significant objects, I made sure that I used like smudge and a sally bag. And so that was the way that they described where the sally bag was. And then using the seasonal round, like I used that as one of the instances of the stories when I was trying to get those terms. Sorry. And then the, a coyote story. So my way of giving back to my community and making sure that it was more of like a teachable approach instead of um, kind of how the history of how linguists have kind of came to our community, taking what they needed for their research. And then a lot of times they don't bring it back to the community to really, um, you know, share what they, what they found about the language. And so I thought through coyote stories, that's our, our way of enculturation 
So I created the story that is similar to a coyote story. And that's like our way of teaching it here with our students is having, you know, the storytelling method to teach about these here, there words. And then speaking and writing in Salish. So I used a lot of Salish throughout my thesis and making sure like the beginning pages were like all in Salish and then having that indigenous art throughout my thesis. So there was a section about planes in Din Sign Language that stuck with such and lip that over there, you know, over there is like your lip movements of like how far it's over there. So that's important because it's also part of that here, their demonstrative system, because you're using this kind of nonverbal visual uh, like gesture to what you're talking about. And then the sign language, there's signs to go along with all of those, like here, there, over here, over there. And so um, I made sure that I used this uh, digital ledger art. And it's also of some of our tribal elders, or at least ancestors, like the guy in the middle is Chief Kustada. And I just kind of changed around like his arm movement from, um, you know, what he was wearing in a certain picture. And then the other guy is the Sedlish guy, I forgot what his name is. Um, and then the lip movement is just, you know, uh, illustration that I did because I couldn't find anybody that was really from our community doing it. Um, but yeah, signs. And uh, the other ways that I like to teach through my art is just creating, um, you know, like ledger art. This is some deer, some saudli, and teaching about it through a game. And so this is one of the games that I created about Salish fire knowledge. And I created this for the Montana Natural History Center. And so I think they're using it for um, some of their teaching um, over there, their curriculum. And it teaches about the Salish fire knowledge. And so um, I even had some fire on another um, art piece that I did of this. But it's this really cool information and stories about how we communally hunted a long time ago by starting fires. And not only are you um, like cleaning the land, like you're you're doing a lot of like land land management through um, through this communal hunt. And so, uh, yeah, teaching through stories, through interactive games and artwork. So actually even creating their own artwork based around these different aspects of our culture. So this is like the migrator, hibernator, um, like those kinds of animals. So this was a fun game that included like indigenous science and the science behind the animals and things that were happening. But then you're kind of adding and integrating this like Salish knowledge and the things and the ways that we interacted with a lot of these animals and sometimes our stories. So for the ram, you could tell that ram story, that coyote story, it's winter months. Oh, yeah. And one other thing that I wanted to say about ledger art is the reason why I'm so inspired and influenced by ledger art is because um, I guess a lot of it has to do with like my husband. I was doing a lot of the like drawing and painting, but uh, he he's the reason why I think we end up having all these conversations and I end up uh, you know, really just liking what he had to say about ledger art. And like um, we've been talking about it since pretty much we got together because he taught uh, art classes and so it really just makes me think critically too about my own art and uh, I was always doing these coyote stories but now I like to do it through ledger art because it just kind of shows those important aspects of a story versus you know that European art and doing like the landscape and the things that kind of don't really matter within the story and so now that I use ledger art uh, it just helps me to connect with my ancestors too, because it has to do with like the pictographic art and like, you know, all these old, old like cave designs, you know, and we're, we're still using some of those designs and those references to explaining history through winter counts and thinking about ledger art is it's from um, the boarding school era. So this was a time where our people weren't able to talk our language to share or teach our culture like publicly. And so for them, the only way they could express themselves and to talk their language or at least think it, you know, and get it down and out is on paper through ledger art. And so that was the way that they were able to 
illustrate their dreams and cultural information from their people without maybe being abused maybe they were but like at least we see essences of what the tribal history is the perspective of our indigenous history versus from the suyapis saying what happened you know so um i just kind of like using this older paper from like the 1800s and it's a time now where we could freely share our language and culture out there and so it's just beautiful to have that voice and to continue on the ways that we um, express ourselves. Now, I know I don't have very much time. Oh, I guess I have open speech. Oh, no. so I'll, quite, I'll just really quick talk about this. This is a book that my husband illustrated and I translated. And the, the way that we kind of indigenized this book, it was written by a non skadli person, um, Georgia Smyze. And um, it was really cool because it had a lot of that like science behind um, things, you know, like we talk about um, like the insamke and kind of like real instances that are happening here, like near Flathead Lake. And my husband did all those illustrations and he included a lot of like... Uh, our native plants in his illustrations. And it was from like the drives of going out and gathering. And so I thought that was cool how he just kind of used different shots and like the lighting on these native plants. And he created the art for this book and then the translations of the Sedlish. But I love that it has this local ecology. And then we included like art and language. So it really has this like place-based way of teaching where there's not very many books that are you know, about our own area here. And so this is like also a picture that Cameron took when we were up at Blue Bay, and then he added this bear, but it's uh, it's just a good way to teach our kids about the potential risks of zebra mussels and how sad it would be if, you know, if they took over and we wouldn't be able to walk on the beach. So there's just a lot of meaning behind this book. And I love that we were able to be part of that and kind of add our Salish, um our scaredly twist on it and adding that Salish language. Oh no. And so I kind of pretty much mentioned like how I already include uh, history behind like these different elders through my ledger art. And the centerpiece is for me telling a coyote story through the Missoula Writing Collaborative. I was um, telling coyote stories and then the kids were writing stories that were kind of based around their own stories of how things came to be. And so they did ledger art and they're just kind of learning these forms of indigenous Sedlish storytelling. Now, so this is one instance of an older picture of a Sedlish woman and then how I like kind of indigenous or uh, digitalized it and made it, uh, you know, have color slightly changed. No, and this is kind of recently we um, took our cedar bark baskets and I added my digital design to it by um, what do you call it? laser engraving so it was pretty cool to see like how fast it was to add my design and it was just like slightly burnt and it's just beautiful how we could have all these more um, contemporary ways of adding our art to our traditional art forms. No, and then this is Hulhuilt LLC, and this is my husband and I's new business, and it's uh, Indigenous Education Consulting. And so, yeah, if you'd like to check out our website and see what we're up to, and um, yeah, if you ever want to consult, we do a lot of like Salish translations and um, quite like a really big array of things. So, I'm not sure yet. Okay. <laughs> Questions? Aspen, I just want to thank you so much. First off, what a visually beautiful presentation. Like your presentation is art. Mm -hmm. um, it's so amazing. I kind of, I, I, I want to distill down a, a few things. I know we are running um, uh, kind, of, kind of tight on time. And so we may have time to take one or two questions if you have a question and you want to put it into the chat, that would be amazing. Um, you know, I just think it's so special how the intersectionality of your identity, uh, you know, then distills down into culture, I mean, overall, and art, 
Um, so you've got, you know, your language, family, ancestors, um, imagery, the clothes, jewelry, other uh, decorative aspects of the, um, the items that are part of our everyday lives. And then of course, land and place, the plants, the food, the animals, all of that, um, you know, really becomes, I mean, that, that is identity and that is culture uh, one in the same. I don't think that um, everybody has the opportunity to have all of those things. And so I think it's so really special how you bring it all together. Um, and then, you know, this idea that uh, that traditional tools for for culture are also art and the, the thought that you are uh, creating heirlooms to pass not only that knowledge down, um, but that you are adding the traditional uh, imagery to the more contemporary materials, um, knowing that those items are going to endure into the future, uh, as opposed to the more traditional materials that we're breaking down. It's this um, brilliant sort of evolution of ways of passing knowledge. Um, and I just love, love, love the way that you go back to that, um, uh, the the tools and the things that are used in everyday life, uh, also having that same um, space, holding that same space as art, and that a uh, good making good with your hands process, I I think is so fascinating. And um, you know, no matter what form of art you practice, process is part of it, right? And so even when I think of like a painter maybe doesn't always isn't he always able fully relate to a sculptor in some aspects um some we all can relate to the process of how we get there and it's so um uh important uh as um a function and as um a way to pass that history through your art thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I'm checking right now for questions in the chat. Um, it looks like there's a question about tolerators um, and it's whether or not that's from a story. Yeah, so that's not actually from like a traditional story, like from the natural montana history center they had um already all this information on like the science behind behind like the migrators tolerators and, and hibernators and so um i just end up taking our own um like terms and like creating this story and like a game for it and so uh yeah it's not from our traditional stories but um yeah it's just kind of like what actually happens in the wild <laughs> Oh, and I saw another question about like why no faces and for ledger art and a lot of like pictographic art and our indigenous art, uh, it's always about like sort of the designs and tribal specific designs and kind of that important information that, you know, conveys uh, like who it is. So through our designs and regalia, you could tell which tribe it comes from and sometimes even which family. And so that's why we don't have faces like whereas um, European art is so, you know, all about the detail of the hair and like making everything look perfect like a picture. Whereas, um, yeah, the jar it's just doesn't have face facial features or like, you know, the hair on the animals. Sometimes even the hoofs aren't on there. So I, I want to just take maybe this, it, I don't see any additional questions in the chat. Um, I want to maybe just take this last couple of minutes to talk about uh, uh, something that the, this committee, the uh, Indigenous Initiatives Committee of Open Air and Western Montana Creative Initiatives, which Aspen serves on that, um, on that committee. We have the great fortune of having um, the Aspen's voice, um, Cameron's voice, uh, and you know a, a number of other folks that we've had the opportunity to hear in previous um, uh, sessions uh, of this conversation is that we've been doing 
these artist talks um, and uh, sort of um, conversation every other month. And, and when we have that time, we take up an hour and we feel like it's a really good amount of time, but it sometimes leaves us having additional questions and wanting to dig deeper into some of the ideas or the concepts or, um, you know, really kind of flesh out some things that we just don't have the space for in the amount of time. On the, op the opposite month, we've been prepping for these um, presentations and conversations. And uh, what we're thinking is that going into this next season of this about opening it up to having the bigger group dig into those conversations in a, a much more in-depth way. And so um, thanking you all for your time here today and kind of planting that seed for the future um, and just really appreciating um, Aspen today as we wrap up. Oh, I I thought I turned it on. Maybe I didn't turn it on. What? It just didn't warm it up. <laughs> I don't have control over it. <laughs> I don't know if you do, Stevie. Stevie, Stevie, you're sorry. Um, I'm trying to find it. There we go. It's not muted. Okay. I there. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Amy, for sharing about that. And Aspen, thank you for the beautiful presentation today. Um, I, as a reminder, we we do have everything online, and actually, I'm going to drop it in our chat um, here. So, if you're interested in seeing Cameron's talk, or if you'd like to share Aspen's presentation, um, uh, Salisha Opal had a presentation, and then Amy uh, was on a panel. Um, uh, additionally, and so if you're interested in um, watching any of those um, or would like to share them, um, I'm going to try and find the chat here on this other screen. Um, there's the link to our page, and so you can find that and many of our other artist presentations. And we certainly invite and are excited to include um, additional voices. So if you're interested in in continuing this conversation together with us, if you're interested in joining our committee, um, if you know amazing speakers who would love to um, participate, we are really excited to just continue to grow our community here and grow these conversations together. And um, yeah. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. And Aspen, thank you for just sharing in such a beautiful way. That was um, just a real treat for all of us, I know. Okay, have a great day, guys, and we'll um, we'll see you again. Our our next presentation is in the new year um, with Stella and all, um, and so uh, we'll look for things coming up about that. Okay, take care. Thanks, guys. Bye.